there's the recording lady. <laughs> it's my distinct privilege and honor to introduce to you all the speakers that we'll be hearing stories from today, who, all of which are fellow EO Mepa Bridge members. Priscilla balgobin Boyrul is the co-founder of the law firm, firm Denton's LLP Mauritius. She graduated at the London School of Economics and Political Science and has been called both to the Bar of England and Wales and to the Mauritian Bar. Priscilla's expertise is in corporate, civil and employment law, having been involved in a number of M&As and IPOs in the banking and insurance sectors. Santosh Gujadur is a licensed legal practitioner and is admitted to the New York State Bar. He has a doctorate of law in business law and regulation from Cornell University. As an associate of a leading US law firm, he flexed his muscles in capital markets and equity derivatives transactions and general corporate transactional work. Dej Gujada is a UK qualified chartered accountant with a wealth of experience in the financial sectors of Europe and the United States. He has held positions as CFO of the Children's Investment Fund, as well as the Apollo Management's European Distressed Business. Dej still serves on the board of the investment vehicles of the GP and Hafen, as well as the pooled vehicles of other London-based FCA regulated managers, all of which are stellar accolades, and I think we are in great company today. We're going to be covering three main topics today. Firstly, we'll dive into the ease of doing business and the tax regime in Mauritius, which is something I think we're all interested in. We'll also hear about what it's like to live and work there. And we'll learn about the unique platform that Mauritius offers for investments. And we'll also hear about investment funds and private wealth. Before we dive right in, I wanted to take a moment to remember our EO values. We're all here to learn from one another and to build trust and respect. In the wise words of Terence McKenna, half the time you're thinking, you're actually listening. So I invite you to fire up your curiosity, take a moment to relax, lean in, listen, and think. So with that said, Priscilla, please take the reins and let's get started. Thank you, Nikhil. I will actually hand over to Tage straight away and I, I'll come in a little bit later. All right, sure thing. Sure if Tage doesn't mind. Thank you. Thank you, Pris. Thank you, Nick Hill. Uh, hi, everyone. I think uh, delighted to be here. Uh, the best uh, intro on Mauritius uh, is not on this slide, is actually the 11 EO MEPA bridge members you've got, uh, you know, on your chapter, on your forums. I think that to me is, is the best way to introduce Mauritius, which is my job this afternoon. Uh, I'll tell you a bit more than that, but uh, do not underestimate the value of that. Uh, 11 of us in, in different sectors of work and life uh, looking to welcoming you here. And, and, and no introduction can do justice uh, to you being here and seeing it for yourself. So we are really looking forward to seeing all of you here and, and not on this call in Mauritius in very short order. You've all had the, the um, holiday version of Mauritius. Uh, it's it's uh, a business center. It's an international financial center. Uh, there's, there's lots happening here. Let me try and kind of unstack some of it for you uh, in very basic terms. And then I'll let Priscilla and, and, and Santosh dive in some of the uh, finer details. Uh, we, we've been... Uh, a democratically independent country for over 50 years. Uh, we've had consistent elections, uh, all democratic. We've never had an issue uh, of law and order, uh, you know, of, of any magnitude in this country. Stable is what comes to mind when, when you think of Mauritius. Uh, and bridge is what comes to mind when you think of Mauritius. It is a bridge to many places and, and it is a facilitator jurisdiction. Uh, if I stick to kind of the, the more legal aspects of things, we've inherited both English and French law as our basis. Uh, good news for lawyers, uh, it's complicated, but we haven't tinkered with it. And I think, again, it goes back to stability. Uh, you, you will recognize uh, Anglo-Saxon law, you will recognize French civil law and code in everything that is Mauritius, and that is confidence building. 
In 50 years, we've not played around. We haven't tried to tinker with it. The ultimate court of appeal, should you have a massive problem in this country, remains the Privy Council in the UK. I think the strong legal governance structure has underpinned our, uh, under, underpinned our success uh, rather uh, over well over 50 years of independence. And, and I, I don't think anyone's in the mood to play with that. Uh, the country is safe. Uh, by any standards, uh, you know, crime is low. Uh, if you go looking for it, you'll find it, but uh, crime is low. Uh, it, safety is a core element. Uh, it is um, having moved back here 20 years uh, abroad, I, I find it, you know, incredibly uh, safe and, 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 a, and, a, and a great place to live. Uh, Chris will, will tell you more about that. We've got uh, decent schools. Uh, you'll find Mauritians and expats who've made their home in Mauritius in the leading universities of the world. Uh, no, they're not exceptions. I mean, every year you'll have people in Ivy League, uh, in Oxbridge, in, in the Red Brick universities coming out of our schools. So we've got decent schooling systems for your children. Uh, and, and one of the core requisites of moving to any country, obviously, for, for those of us with, with kids. We're in a decent time zone. Uh, Dubai is how it's known as, uh, but you know, very, very much suited to travel in the region, very much suited to work from anywhere uh, in the region. Uh, we are, uh, you know, in, in terms of doing business, uh, we've won a number of accolades over the years, but it is really, uh, we've been a, uh, and, and here's a slide uh, to prove it, clearly we put all the good news on, but uh, that's not a coincidence. It, it is not a coincidence. We are home to 25,000, what we call global business companies, uh, which don't touch our local economy. That, that's a lot of companies who've chosen to make us home over the last 40 years uh, of building a financial center. Uh, we've, We've uh, transacted in through our banking system, through our fiduciary system, through our financial system, uh, a good chunk of FDI that has gone into India over the years for tax treaty reasons and, and other reasons. Uh, as recently as last week, I think there was an announcement that over the last two years, uh, an average of 9% of FDI going into Africa overall uh, and much more in sub-Saharan Africa has, has uh, originated from Mauritius. Uh, it is uh, a uh, country where, you know, we have, uh, you know, low tax, I wouldn't call it no tax. Uh, we have no capital gains tax, which is a great place to headquarter your company if you are looking uh, to, to sell, and, and many of us in EO, uh, including Satoshi and I just did a sale, are looking to sell, to build to sell. So it's a great place to headquarter, to regionally headquarter your company. We don't have capital gains. You can become uh, a resident fairly easily. Uh, Chris will take you through that in the live, work, and play section. We have no inheritance tax. Uh, we do not believe in taxing new wealth. We're a relatively new country. And uh, since independence, we took a very specific decision not to tax people uh, you know, on their hard earned money when they pass it on to their kids. So great news again for, for, for many of you looking to do wealth planning out of here. We've got no foreign exchange control. Uh, you can come in with your money, you can leave with your money as long as your country allows you to do it. Uh, we, we have global banks, we have local banks, we have one of them on the score right now, Brian runs a bank, uh, a large local bank, ABC. Uh, we have no withholding uh, on, on your money coming in or out. Uh, we can't control other countries, but what we're telling you is, you know, this is, we, we are visa free uh, as a country, not only for tourists, in many respects. The ability to get a visa to live and work here has been massively relaxed post COVID. They were already relaxed. Uh, we are, uh, we've handled COVID fairly well, you know, touch wood. 66% uh, of the country is double shot vaccinated, over 75% single shot. Uh, I think we're talking uh, third shots have begun last week. 
uh, it is generally, you know, uh, again, I, 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 I knock on wood in saying it, uh, we've, we've done well as a place to be and live and, and, and put your family in what is a medically uncertain world out there. Uh, we're fairly cost efficient, whether you look at our uh, legal banking, corporate uh, cost of living uh, elements, it's a fairly cost efficient country when you compare to the quality that you're getting in, re in return. Just kind of, these are by and large, some of the uh, points I wanted to make uh, on, on the jurisdiction as an intro. Satosh and Pris were gonna walk you through how you can benefit from these uh, attributes that we have. Uh, my final point, and, and this is the point uh, is, uh, don't forget you've got 11 business facilitators, uh, not all of them with my apologies are on this slide right now, but spanning a number of industries uh, in your uh, Mauritian, uh, you know, uh, resident EO MEPA members. So be, if you're looking for things in, in legal, in banking, corporate, private wealth, real estate, construction, you, you, you name it, and, and whatever sectors you don't find here, uh, I am sure with two phone calls, we can connect you into it. So uh, I'll, I'll stop here as a quick intro to Mauritius, and I'll hand over back to you, Pris, to, to kind of take a deeper dive into some of the topics. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you, Pris. Thank you, Tej. So just to be, before I begin, the bird you saw um, in the beginning of the video is actually ours. So maybe that's a first port of call to tempt you to come on the island. Um, when we talk about Mauritius here, we want to talk about work, invest, acquire, live, retire. Um, I think in post-COVID, a lot of us have been thinking about how great it is to be in our country, but how amazing it would be to have a second home as well. I know myself sitting in Russia, so I've been thinking about having a second home in another country would be a great thing. So maybe we can tempt you into thinking about Mauritius. Uh, already, we're all entrepreneurs on this school as a self-employed entrepreneur. If you have a minimum investment of $35,000 in a professional activity and you show that you have at least two potential clients, then you're eligible for 10 years occupation permit. That's quite a lot. Uh, uh, an investment of $35,000 would also take you there on an occupation permit of um, 10 years. Uh, a net asset value of $50,000 um, USD in case you have inherited such a business from your family and that you have had a cumulative turnover of 12 million rupees over the past three-year period. Um, it can be in healthcare, it can be in BPO, it can be in fintech, agro-industry, manufacturing, ocean economy, renewable energy. Basically, I guess most of the sectors that um, you, you would be in and um, if ever you have some inheritance for $50,000, again, you could relocate to Mauritius and be here for 10 years. You could also invest in high-tech machines, equipment for USD $25,000 again. Um, if you are quite innovative and Mauritius, um, very often we feel like we've lacked in the innovative sector. So there is, you don't need any minimum, um, there's a minimum requirement. You just have to come with an interesting project submitted to the Economic Development Board. And uh, you would have a lot of um, tax incentives, a lot of um, support, and you could relocate here. You could also invest 375,000 USD in a qualifying uh, business agro-industry, cinema, communication, banking. You could invest in Brian's bank if he's keen, construction, education, you name it. Financial services, plenty of them on this call. Uh, with any investment, you could again get your 10 years visa. Then there is the premium visa. During COVID, and I must say myself because we, we do work in that field quite a bit, it's um, funny how we receive requests from everywhere in the world, from countries where actually we've been approached with the first line being, we haven't heard of Mauritius. We were not interested in, in working with Mauritius, but there's such a high demand 
that we felt we would approach you so we could present your country to our clients. And now we have a request from the US, from Europe. We've always had requests from South Africa, uh, from French people who tend to love Mauritius for its beach, for its French food, French speaking people. But we have requests from everywhere, especially in relation to a premium visa. Basically, you can come, you don't need any minimum um, expenses or anything, you make an application, you can come for a long stay as a tourist, a retiree, a professional, sit on the beach, bring your laptop, you stay for one year with an option to review, so long your, your business is still in Botswana, in Kenya, in India, wherever you're sitting, and you're not taking the job of someone in Mauritius, you're very welcome to come sit on the beach, come sit on that boat, work from there, and just chill for as long as you want to. You would also um, be able to buy a property, so long the price is a minimum of 375,000 um, USD in one of the beautiful um, selected resorts under, called, under PDS scheme. These tend to be beautiful, many of them by the beach, uh, very high standard. They start from 375,000 USD. Many of them are selling at 4 million USD, 2 million USD. Your, your neighbors are bound to be very interesting persons keen to remain low key, free from paparazzi, and uh, you're guaranteed a nice environment. So this is for you moving in here with your kids and, and your family, who would all uh, get a permit following your permit, because Mauritius is very, immigration rules are very keen to keep the family together. And uh, a last one, I just want to mention very briefly, film rebate scheme. Uh, maybe, maybe if you've been watching Netflix, you've seen the latest movie shot in Mauritius by produced by Alicia Keys. Personally, I found it a little bit um, too romantic, a little bit cheesy, but it's been number one on the in the US and everywhere else for so many weeks. And the only conclusion with that is that you know, like Emily in Paris made us dream, but all my French friends said oh, it's a bit of a silly movie, but seeing all these beautiful views of Paris made us dream. That movie as well shows beautiful pictures and you know shots of Mauritius. And in the time of COVID, when a lot of people have been sitting in cramped spaces and places which felt a little bit less safe health-wise, it is a beautiful place to come, place where you can produce a movie, you can invest in production of a movie, that could be your next project, make life a bit more exciting. There you, you get 30% refund up to 40% rebate on all the qualifying expenses. And um, well, why not? This could be your next project. And um, yes, over to you, Santos, for the more boring stuff. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Nikhil and Tej as well. Uh, I think just uh, Tej briefly touched on it. Uh, I'll just introduce. Uh, on a high level, the use of the uh, jurisdiction as a platform for investments. Um, we've always focused on India and Africa, but and more so Sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, it's also a regional platform for global investments. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, the, the, the attributes that make the IFC or, or uh, provide the foundation of the IFC have been you know, I think accurately paraphrased by Tej, sound legal system, uh, uh, no foreign exchange control, uh, good banking, legal services. Uh, so I won't retouch on that, but what you, what as a result of having all this ecosystem uh, over the last 40 years or so, uh, Mauritius has been home for about 20, to about 25,000 global business companies. Uh, what does that mean is these are companies that have the primary purpose of investing outside Mauritius. They are, uh, they are uh, incorporated here, uh, but their primary purpose is to invest outside Mauritius. Uh, other than Luxembourg, uh, Mauritius is the second country in the world with uh, our banking flows through the country is about 50 times the size of our GDP, just to give you a sense, which is the second highest uh, banking flow in the world uh, the, uh, after Luxembourg. So it's a very uh, investor friendly and uh, multinational friendly or, or, or simply entrepreneur friendly place uh, to base yourself and to do business. 
the way it works is uh, it's fairly regulated uh, for the reputation of the of the jurisdiction itself. Uh, if you, we are, as I say that, we are, with a disclaimer, we are currently on a gray list of the FATF, but we're supposed to exit that in the coming weeks, all things going well. Uh, this is in a sense, out of the 40 recommendations that the FATF has on compliance and regulatory matters, uh, Mauritius has been, is now compliant on 39 of them out of 40 which uh, by the time next year roll around, rolls around, will be the first country in the world to be compliant on all 40 FATF recommendations. Uh, as entrepreneurs and people acting in this uh, jurisdiction ourselves, we don't love it because we're, it's not a great place to get a gold medal in, but it's actually also a reflection of the approach uh, of how cautiously the government wants to treat its reputation and the way we proceed. Uh, so fairly regulated sector, you have to go through authorized uh, advisors, uh, they're called management companies, uh, Apex being one of them, we also mentioned Intercontinental, where Tommy is also a MEPA bridge member, also a partner. Uh, you have to be licensed by the Financial Services Commission after providing fairly detailed KYC and AML uh, information. Uh, you have to bank in the country as a primary bank, and you can use you can have secondary bank accounts elsewhere. And uh, generally, you can choose your legal type, your entity type. It can be a company limited by shares, trusts, foundations, partnerships, uh, societes. If you prefer the French system, uh, whatever it is, very flexible, very easy to structure. Uh, once you get licensed by the Financial Services Commission. It's uh, depending on the type of and nature of activity that is intended. Most of it is generally investment holding, headquartering, or passive structures. That's those are fairly easy, but we equally know of, uh, or, or there are equally, I think at this point, hundreds of region uh, regional companies that are headquartered here, uh, operating diverse in diverse. Uh, fields like telecommunications, um, logistic entities uh, that are operating pan Africa. Uh, and uh, so you, you've got a whole variety of activity that can happen through the global business sector in Mauritius. Uh, this is a sector that is increasingly uh, becoming popular, especially where with all the facilities being provided to people to relocate to Mauritius and to actually move here, we're seeing we're moving from what, for lack of a better word, used to be a letterbox jurisdiction. Uh, if you think Cayman, think BVI, think other places, uh, to now becoming a more and more a jurisdiction of substance uh, where actually you're having senior management or even middle management moving to the country with operations still existing where they are and in, in countries where the investments are or where the operations are. You have uh, the global business sector, uh, also encompasses a very important subsector, <clears throat> which is linked to the investment funds, uh, primarily uh, a, a sector that uh, was, was conceived on the back of uh, of, of the India uh, treaty we on the, the treaty we had with India, and uh, but that has now grown into we're seeing an increasing number of. African venture uh, VC funds that are lo located in Mauritius. We're seeing an increasing number of infra and private equity funds. Uh, those tend to be less common just because of the market size and the deal-making opportunity in Africa uh, where commodities tend to, 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 uh, to dominate, but uh, the mid-market and the growth segments are also starting to come in uh, as the region grows. And uh, clearly the other angle of this is uh, there, there is so much private wealth coming into the system that it needs to have, uh, firstly, a domicile or a structure to, to house it, and secondly, the uh, skill set to actually deploy the capital and manage it. So we're seeing increasing element of wealth, private wealth, uh, investment funds, structuring that is also very much part or a sub-part of the global business sector. We have a couple of... Uh, we have a couple of, uh, I think, uh, just diversity of, 
of opportunities that are, arise out of these, uh, whether it's for the banking sector, whether it's for legal services, whether it's for everything else that accompanies these requirements, uh, it has a knock-on effect on everything. And the global business sector is clearly one of the pillars of what we're trying to build here in Mauritius. I think one of the larger incentives for people to come and use the jurisdiction is also, I think, fairly uh, unknown and unpublicized. We have uh, trade agreements, free trade agreements with uh, India and China, which are critical to the continent. And here, I'll probably just hand back to Pris to just walk you through those uh, trade agreements, because those actually make a fundamental difference in the way you interact with these two giants. Yeah, sure. So basically, Mauritius is signatory to multilateral trade agreements, regional trade agreements, um, African ones, uh, Chinese bilateral trade agreements, uh, Chinese ones, Turkey, Pakistan. Uh, these are, I mean, I didn't propose to go into details on these agreements, but very quickly on two of them, which might be more relevant to us today, because I don't think we have any Chinese on this call. There's the SECPA, which is the Comprehensive Economic Cooperation and Partnership Agreement signed between Mauritius and India. Extremely interesting, interesting for us Mauritians, because we get a lot of um, benefit from preferential market access uh, on 600 more products in India. But for those in India on this call based in India, there is preferential access on 310 products with uh, tariff rate quotas uh, when you're uh, exporting to Mauritius. So spices, tea, plastic articles, wooden furniture, motor vehicles. So um, probably our, um, our EU fellow members in India should pay uh, quite a bit of attention to the SECPA agreement. It's a fairly new agreement with Mauritius, with Africa, but um, it's a revolutionary one. Some have said that it's as interesting as the internet when it was created. It really is phenomenal, but most people are not aware of it. So as businesses, as entrepreneurs, uh, you really should pay some attention to it if possible. And what is um, very interesting for uh, Mauritius as well and for Africa is that Mauritius is also signatory to the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement and uh, it's of course the largest free trade area in the world. Us all, we are all from African countries, we should be doing more business between, I mean I know EU is not, you know, it's not about promoting our businesses but at the end of the day we should or be doing more businesses between our countries. There are so much, um, so many facilities, advantages, tariff-wise, custom-wise, tax-wise, that if any of you is interested, we could get on another call to, to talk about it. But basically, uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement in Africa, it will, the aim is to progressively eliminate tariff among member countries and cover policy areas. So basically, imagine, us all being able to trade with each other uh, free of uh, any tariff. And um, so this is something to, to seriously be considered because contrary really to the European Union, to, to the US, there hasn't been as much um, exchange, export and cooperation between us, our African countries. And that's something we should really make the most of it. Uh, but more details on another call, more specifically for anyone who would be uh, actively interested in looking into it. That's it on my side, Nikhil. Thanks so much, Priscilla, Tej, and Santosh. Um, have we covered the private wealth topic? I've touched uh, on it briefly, Nikhil. I think just it's the slide is more for information purposes, but the private wealth, maybe I'll add one topic here. Uh, as people are buying properties, relocating their finances or moving to Mauritius, they're also finding this as a convenient place given the lack of exchange controls to actually put in structures for, uh, for hereditary or other wealth planning reasons. Uh, it's, uh, there's no inheritance tax. I think Tej touched on this. And uh, what you're seeing on the private wealth side is we're seeing an increasing number of people who would traditionally choose to go to Jersey uh, which was, I think, the favorite for South Africans in particular in the past, and uh, now migrating to Mauritian trusts and uh, foundations and whatever the chosen vehicle is. 
And this is creating clearly uh, a lot of opportunities and knock-on effects in the economy. Uh, on the fund structuring side, uh, again, very sort of generic. I'm not sure uh, people are, uh, or will be, uh, it's just a, a sense that there are a thousand uh, collective investment schemes in Mauritius, uh, most of them focused uh, on India and Africa. And you're seeing an increasing number of them being managed <clears throat> out of Mauritius itself. Uh, with managers moving here, uh, if that is of interest from a uh, investment perspective. But uh, with that, I think what we would suggest, Nikhil, is uh, probably just pause. And, uh, you know, if there's any specific area where, you know, we, 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 want, we want to explore further, we can dig in. Thanks so much, guys. I really feel overwhelmed with information here, and I'm astonished that we got through all of that in 30 minutes or, or so. Um, so I'm getting a sense that Mauritius is a bit of a financial paradise, uh, perhaps for multinational corporations and an opportunity for us aspiring multinationals to, to pay attention to. I wasn't aware about all those trade agreements, so that's been an eye opener for me. I really appreciate the, the legal expertise, the financial expertise, the wealth of knowledge that you guys have. But there's something that I think you guys missed out on uh, that I'd really like to understand better about Mauritius. Yes, we talk about being African neighbors, but to me, Mauritius is a whole world away. I really want to get a sense of what it's like to live there. And I'll give you one thing that is bugging me. I was terrible at French in school. I, I, I pretty much messed up all my tests in French. Uh, so I'm not very good at French, even though I'm supposed to know it. So without know, knowing much French, what would I be missing out on in Mauritius? May, may I take it? that up? Bra Brian, this is Brian here. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I was going to add on to what my, my friends have said about Mauritius is that, um, yeah, we are uh, fully bilingual. Uh, even though the official language is English, uh, uh, most of us, I, I would say, yeah, a great majority of us speak both English and French. And that would be quite useful uh, in dealing with Africa because depending on which side you're on, you either speak French or English. And I'm sure if we had to find a Portuguese speaking Mauritian, we could find it too for, to deal with Angola and Mozambique. So this is quite um, useful, but uh, a lot of people just, I mean, expats, they speak English and, and they get by quite easily because like I said, everyone speaks English, even if you're going down to the South or in a remote area and you're lost, you ask for directions in English, there'd be no problem. Um, one, one thing I wanted to touch on maybe is uh, a sort of a live example that I got from a, from a CEO of a foreign company who's based here. Um, it, it happens to be a Chinese company and, and they originally came here just to have a, like a regional headquarter, which is one of the schemes by, by EDB. And then just to do the back office stuff, right? And then he said, he realized that um, by, you know, talking to people left and right, that re they realized that Mauritians actually, uh, in Mauritius, we have quite a um, highly skilled workforce. And, and uh, he's in the uh, in a business where you need a lot of engineers. And he didn't realize that uh, Mauritius has quite a lot of qualified engineers uh, and qualified and experienced and also at, at a very uh, reasonable cost on, on a global scale, right? And finally, they ended up not only having the back office, but having part of the technical uh, department operating out of Mauritius as well, because they, 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 were, they managed to find the, the people they require uh, here. So um, yeah, so that worked out quite well for them, but they didn't expect that originally when they were coming because it was only, they were only coming for the back office. That's and speaking amazing. of back office, I believe we have the highest number of accountants per capita or something like that. Ted would know because he's one. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't make it, but uh, apparently we have so many accounts here. So uh, that's a good thing as well, I think. And then the last thing I have to say about Mauritius is that we got uh, 10 amazing golf courses here. <laughs> well, not nine really good ones and one, okay, one. But, um, and then, yeah, it's a great life. I mean, me, myself, I, I was born here and then I moved to Canada when I was little and I've been back here 
uh, almost 30 years. And um, yeah, yeah, I can't complain. I mean, it's not perfect, obviously, like any other places around the world. But yeah, it is a nice place to live after all. It's making me thank you. I'm learning more <laughs> with each conversation. You touched on something that I actually wanted to dig into a little bit more is, is the talent pool that you have in Mauritius. So one of the problems that we faced in Botswana is, is brain drain, where we have uh, maybe mid-level universities here, people, graduates kind of move out of the country to, to get university degrees and then they don't come back, or the best and brightest ship out and just you know get employed out of the country. What's that like in Mauritius? Is that happening there? Or you mentioned the engineers and the accountants. Are there any other sectors that, that Mauritius is strong in? We, 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 yeah, we Nicola, I, I can take this one if you wish. Uh, there it is. We are getting a brain drain, I think, fairly common for most mid income countries to face similar problems, uh, in particular when it comes to talent. Talent is very mobile globally today. But what we've seen as a general trend is uh, people tend to come back. I mean, if you just look on this call itself, uh, the majority of us have at some point or the other been outside Mauritius, but we've come back uh, to, the, to the country. And uh, so you tend to see us, uh, a, a, I think between the ages of 80 to, I'll generalize 30, 35, whatever it is, uh they there's a tendency to, to stay out of the country and then a tendency to come back uh that said it's a it's a decent pop decent sized population for an island you're talking 1.3 million people um uh, it's not a lot certainly by the continental measures but uh, for an island it's decent sized and the internal pool itself is is fairly consistent uh we have a uh, good few universities here uh, locally, uh, some of them affiliated with global uh, universities, whether French, Australian, um, English, and others, uh, some local ones as well. The University of Mauritius is an excellent feeder by itself for, professional, uh, for professionals. And uh, you have a very diverse skill set. Like Brian said, I, we have the highest number of accountant per capita in the world. Uh, Priscilla will probably agree that we have too many lawyers. And uh, there is, uh, we, we also have a lot of engineers. Uh, if you look at regionally, SD Works, Accenture, these are sizable uh, companies that operate entire, I mean, they, they operate entire buildings out of Mauritius. It's not even like floors. So they're a very diverse skill set and a steady flow of talent that keeps coming in. And also, if I may add, um, the government has tried to encourage uh, uh, Mauritians living abroad to come back. So they put together this diaspora scheme uh, where if you, I think if you've been out of the country for more than five years, so you can come back and work and you get, um, uh, was it income tax free for uh, a tax holiday for 10 years, is it? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Ta tax holiday. For yeah, tax and you get a, a you get a duty free allowance. I mean, duty allowance of two million for a car. Something yeah. like that. So, yeah. so they are encouraging uh, Mauritians to come back to live uh, uh, back here, so that you know we can have this even higher skilled workforce. Sounds Thanks. to me that you've got a, a rare commodity and that's a proactive and engaged government. So I congratulate you for that. Maybe this is a point that I'd like to open it up. Any other, any other questions for the other members of the call? Anybody interested or curious about anything? Do I see a hand with this? So I have a question. Um, obviously, we talk about much larger business. Thank you. That was actually very, very insightful. I know I've been there a couple of times for EO, but it was nice to kind of hear, hear the other side of it. I, um, as some of you might know, I run um, a coffee roastery and a coffee business. Um, if we wanted to explore, you know, and we're kind of looking at things beyond our own market, if we wanted to kind of think about coming into that market, whether that's through the cafe-led approach, whether that's through the distribution approach, I mean, how big is the economy at the more premium or the, you know, the, the higher kind of socioeconomic spectrum? I guess, you know, you think about people like EO members, may, maybe some of the people that might work for us, how big is that opportunity in 
general? I mean, not just for my business, but, but in general, think about bars, restaurants, cafes. What, what does that look like? We've got uh, British, a population of 1.3, but, but more relevant uh, to high-end spending, we've got one plus million tourists coming here. And the bulk of them are flying 12 hours plus uh, to get here. So, you know, the reason us Mauritians get access to good wine, good cheese, good many things is because of those 1. Million, 1 million tourists, right? Because their, their consumption pattern and, and the way they consume and coffee being one of those things uh, is significantly higher than what a 1 million population market may give the semblance of. So this is actually quite a deep market when it comes to, to uh, well, deep is relative word, but it is much deeper than the million people would let it look like. Uh, in terms of specialists, I mean, we have an EO member that, that is not in MEPA, but, but is considering Mario is, runs a fine foods business. In fact, his business is called Fine Foods. Brian on the call here runs uh, one of his uh, family businesses is in, is in foods. Uh, there clearly are avenues for you to explore, as I said when I, I started. Between those 11 EO MEPA members that are here, uh, I'm fairly certain with, you know, either within those membership or with two phone calls, we can get you more data. But uh, there, there clearly is an appetite for luxury in this market, right? Uh, you, 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 you can just look at it. We, we sell per capita the most, the most Porsches in, 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 in Africa or the world. Brian can correct me. Uh, we, th there is appetite for luxury in this country. Absolutely. And Tej, I'll just add two, two pieces to that. Uh, if, if One is we briefly flirted with being a high, high income country, uh, Ritesh, just to give you a sense. Uh, last year, before we went through a COVID-related, well, um, undeclared depreciation of our month, of our rupee, uh, but uh, we were a high-income country. So just the 1.3 million itself is actually very high spending uh, as compared to what you have. And I think people underestimate that uh, the 2 million or so market that we have here, one plus one tourists, is actually... Um, you know, sometimes better than a five to 10 million person uh, area, geographic area, just because of the spending power that is, gets attributed to it. Great, thank you. Ritesh, funny enough, funny enough, if you look at coffee, right, as a, as a beverage, uh, when I came back 29 years ago, I mean, no one was drinking coffee at the time. It was all tea. And in the last few years, somehow this, this has developed into our culture. And now you have so many uh, coffee shops around, right? I mean, in Port Louis, maybe just Port Louis within a 15 minute walk, you can have like, I don't know, six or seven coffee shops. And uh, I don't know, Vida Cafe is a South African franchise? Yes, it, it is South yeah. Africa. And so actually, it's present in Mauritius, yeah. Go ahead. You Priscilla. would not have so many competitors because Coffee, Brian Wright has said coffee is has become a new culture. You have very few. You have Lux Cafe, you have Vidae, you have it's always the same too. And, and uh, then artisan so, artisan coffee, right? Truth yeah, coffee or something like that. Coffee. And it's Which like is, it's it's really all over, right? <laughs> and it's it's amazing. I mean, even my wife, I mean, she grew up in Mauritius, and they always drank tea, and then all of a sudden they, they started developing this liking for coffee, which was quite extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, super. Very interesting. Um, Brian and Priscilla, I'll definitely reach out to you guys offline. But thank you for a really informative uh, uh, presentation today. Thanks. And by the way, I tried your coffee, Ritesh. It's very good. <laughs> not, not soliciting, but if anybody wants to, wants to open a coffee shop in Mauritius, I'll trade a coffee shop for a beach hut. For a beach hut. So. <laughs> it's great. It's great. I've got one more question. I'm interested in your food. You've got such a multicultural, you know, makeup of the demographic there. What do you guys eat every day? Like, what's what's the kind of food that you know I would expect when I come to Mauritius? It's so diverse. Each Mauritian will give you a different answer. I don't think any Mauritian, but that's that's the beauty of it. Um, 
literally numerous and will give you the same answer. Wow. You, some houses are having Indian food, some are having French food, some are having Chinese food. Um, our family's favorite food is Chinese. It's certainly not Indian. We cook French food four times a week. And um, so it's, it's, it's a strange mix, but I'll leave it to the others as well. Yeah. No, and then you can go to an uh, Italian restaurant run, run by Italians, right? And uh, we do have a Greek restaurant as well. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's very, it's, it's way above the, 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 uh, the different cultures that exist in Mauritius. And we have even more than that. What about Thai the restaurant? If, if I may add, uh, Mauritius, Mauritius is a country where, where all the population migrated. So all, all of us are descendants of migrated, migration people. So, and, and I think the beauty of Mauritius uh, lies in its food because it's the only, only aspect which is really uh, mingled and, and I would say uh, integrated fully. You can see, uh, you can walk in a Chinese restaurant and you go in the kitchen and there's no Chinese cooking. It's an Indian who owns a restaurant or vice versa. You go to an Indian restaurant, you see a Chinese serving you or, or Indians eating French food. And, and it's so, so mixed. And, and each one has been able to integrate a little bit of each culture in its own food. And that's, for me, it's the beauty of Mauritius and shows how a multicultural country can, can unite on, uh, on a dish, on, on, the, on the plate. And, and, and that's also what is the stability of Mauritius that uh, Tej and, and everyone was talking about, is this, this uh, harmony of living together Although we all came from diverse origins and diverse country, but through the generations, we have been able to come into more or less into one, at least on, in, on our dish on the table, and that's great. That's so comforting to hear. And it actually paints a totally different picture from the sense I got from reading Mauritius' Wikipedia page. I don't know if anybody's read it, but I got a sense that there's, there's a lot of ethnic tension in Mauritius for the same, same reason that you mentioned, Eric, that uh, it's a country of migrants. Uh, could you anybody speak to that? Like, what's the ethnic tension like there? Is there any? Is there a myth? The last time we had any form of ethnic tension, uh, Nikhil, was actually in 1967 or 68 when we were getting independence and there was a fear because of uh, the uh, Hindu majority that things would go haywire and that created a spark of uh, pro-independence versus uh, against independence. And I think in the last post-independence, uh, never had a racially or ethnically motivated crime, as far as I recall, in this country. Um, not even talking about tensions here, even a crime related to, you know, someone, you know, getting bashed because of the color of their skin or their name or their religion or whatever it is. Um, I haven't, I don't recall one. There is crime, of yeah. course, but there is no racially motivated. So yeah. uh, I, I think the answer, if that's the perception you've got, I, I think it, it's incorrect. Um, it is absolutely incorrect uh, in, in this. So, yeah, we have the main, the main mosque, which is across the street from Chinatown in Port Louis. I mean, literally across the street, a few meters away. Uh, sometimes I go to mass because I'm, I'm Catholic as well. So I go to mass in Grand Bay and during the mass, you can hear the mosque from across the street, the pray. And somehow uh, we all get along with each other. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. I'm, somebody's got to, thank you for setting the record straight. Somebody's got to go back to Wikipedia and update that page. Clearly, they don't no, know. it's best. It's best you come see for yourself and then you can write it <laughs> <laughs> yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple more questions. Um, looking at, you know, I went on Google Maps and tried to like explore Mauritius from a top-down view, and I got a sense that there's a bit of agriculture going on, and I understand there's a history in sugarcane plantations, and maybe maybe that's from Mauritius's past. But it got me thinking about maybe what what is Mauritius arc been like? Look, been like. Sorry, I'm just bungling the words. What is Mauritius's arc been like? It's now looking to be a financial center. It perhaps had an agricultural background. It is an island. What's an industry that's perhaps in its sunset? Where's the tourism sector going? It's a whole lot of questions in one, but I guess the question is, where has Mauritius been? Where is it going? I 
I think I'll, I'll have a crack at that. I think, look, it, it is, we're multicultural, multi-religion, and, and I think we, we stem from, because of our, you know, what, what the Brits did here, uh, being a sugar colony, and we went into being a textile manufacturer uh, and, and quickly had to give up on that, not quickly over, over a decade or so, because we, we can't compete with the Bangladesh and the, 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 the rest of the world on, on that sector in terms of volume. We became more designers in the textile industry. Uh, financial services has morphed a few times. Tourism has gone you know, in different directions. We have amazing hotels here. Uh, we, we have untapped sea territory. We are a very small island, but because we lay claim on a couple of islands throughout the Indian Ocean, our sea area that we can exploit and remain unexploited, what people call the blue economy, is totally untapped. Uh, we've got no natural resources, and even if we have them somewhere in the sea, we don't even know, right? So uh, there are uh, services is becoming increasingly the driving force, Nikhil, be it, you know, in, in just so many areas. Uh, it, it could be multinationals being here. We see ourselves, you know, borrowing from, from EOMEPA here, we see ourselves as a bridge. This, this is a, a bridge uh, economy where we're, we're here to interface. Uh, anything local will, will have a limit, right? It's, it's X miles, 20 miles by 30 miles. There's only so much you can do in the depth of the economy. But by becoming a bridge, as financial services has shown, you can transit you know, 50 times your GDP for your banking system. Just an example. So there, there is, uh, by encouraging expats and, 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 and other people to make this home, not just come here on holiday, you bring in expertise, you bring in, and I think that is the future of Mauritius, is opening up. Hopefully we don't open up as quickly or as, as savagely as some of the other countries have done uh, to the detriment of their environment and to the det detriment of their architecture, etc. But we, our future lies in opening up, and, 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 and there can be no better example of that than, than this forum we are all part of. Uh, that, that's kind of my two cents on your question. I'm, I'm happy for others to chip in as well. It's a comforting answer, and it gives me hope, and it gives me uh, a, a new sense of more curiosity. Now, like, I have to book my tickets. I can't wait for us to make, have our next event in Mauritius. We're coming up to the hour now, guys. So if there are any other questions, now's the time to raise them. I'll give you a few seconds to raise hands and things like that. If not, we can move towards closing. Um, anybody with questions? Okay, all right. Last thing is to ask the panel, Tej, Santosh, Priscilla, if we want to get more information, if we're interested in buying a boat or a villa or opening up a hotel or bringing my millions of euros and dollars to your doorstep, how do we reach out to you? How do we get in touch? You, you, you get in touch with any one of us, uh, guys. You, this, is, this is not solicitation. Uh, and, 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 you know, we, we, yes, we represented Apex. We've also mentioned Tommy does exactly the same thing. Uh, you, you get in touch with us. We're here to guide. We're here. We would love to have you here on holiday, uh, citizens, as wh whatever you, you call it. You just get in touch with any one of us. It doesn't have to be me, Santosh, or Priscilla. And, and, and uh, you, you will get a response. There is a lot of free information that we would gladly share. So please don't hesitate. And we'd love a good brainstorming as well, because everything that we said to you also applies to us. And when, when, you know, when you take the time and you think about doing the presentation, you realize how much we can do in our own name and we're not doing. So anytime. Wonderful, wonderful. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. So at this point, I feel like a few people have dropped off the call. We've lost a few, so I'm not gonna take a picture, but uh, we'll move towards uh, closing now. I wanna say thank you to our panel. Thank you to Eric, thank you to the attendees of the call. Thank you, Brian, for all your insights and conversation. Really appreciate the time that you've all given us. As a final call to action, 
uh, we will be sending out a survey link and i'm only going to send the slides to people who fill out the survey so that's that's an incentive <laughs> the slides and the link only go out to people who fill out the survey um, but we'll close here looking forward to our next event eric can you give us any insight on when we're coming to mauritius yeah so the next uh, doing in series uh, event will be on the 21st of october um, where we'll have uh, Zakaria and who will talk to us about how to to invest in some uh, in some areas in Africa. So it will be a very interesting uh, interesting talk about uh, investment and uh, how to start up a business in Africa. Yeah. So when are we coming to Mauritius? And when you are coming to Mauritius, well, when you come, our borders are open as from Friday. So anyone is that happening? Can... First of October. First of October. Excellent. And for us uh, EO, we are for our chapter. We are looking at uh, next year for an event, but we'll give you more information when we know about it, more precise. Thank you. And, and I have to add a, a, a small note as to illustrate what we've spoken about. Uh, Zakaria George, the person who Eric just referred and is speaking to us on the twenty-first, his fund is based in Mauritius. Is actually it's a part of ours, so it's uh, it's just an example to illustrate the call, I guess. And I ask a question, please. Yes, please, Abdul Razak. Yeah, uh, if I want to get to Mauritius today, do I need to get visa on arrival, or I need to go to the High Commission in Nigeria or whatever? Can you guide me? Uh, I let me come back to you on that one, Abdul Razak. I, I think most African, if I'm not any member of the African Union, to my recollection, does not need a visa to land in Mauritius. Uh, I'm fairly certain of that. I'll just reconfirm it and drop your note. Okay, thank you so much. That this is a beautiful presentation and it's an opportunity to be able to have a window view of doing business in Mauritius. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks Thank all. You. So we'll close here. Thank you all once again. Looking forward to engaging with you further. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you, Nika. Thank you.